Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So who would have thought uh, such a long simmering, deeply rooted issue as sexual harassment would have blown so widely open in the recent and swift cascading of falling masculine icons. Wow. Happy holidays and welcome back to the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy seen each week in every market in North and South Carolina. I'm Chris William on this edition as we close in on year end. What are those local, regional and national issues that need our attention and how do we and how do they settle into the community dialogue going on around our communities and later on the new CEO of this country's second largest thrift, Mike Lord of the State Employees Credit Union. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Tim Boyum of Capital Tonight, Grady Johnson from SC Biz News, and special guest, Mike Lohr, President and CEO of the State Employees Credit Union. Happy holidays. Welcome to our program. Gentlemen, welcome back. Tim, good to have you back. Thanks Great. for having me. Yay. Yeah. Glad nice. you both are here. I'm going to be sensitive to the fact, and I want to just say this up front, we do not have a female on this panel this week, but I do want to ask you a question about sexual harassment. And in, in as much as it's been a pretty staggering how quickly the wheels have come off this wagon. And when I say that, I mean how quickly some of the icons have fallen, some of the charges have happened, some of the some of these sexual harassment wounds have been have been ripped open. And what I want to ask you specifically, and we're not going to spend the whole program on it because we we would need balance. But Tim, does this start to change? And I know you look at the world of politics with a microscope, but does this start to change inter office uh, relationships and 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 just workplace issues? Does it start to bubble up now? I hope so in some ways, right? I mean, these stories are horrifying that we're hearing, assuming that they're all true. Uh, we've been discussing this conversation as well and what workplaces need to do. I think a lot of it is, is culture. Uh, it's not about having a meeting, you know, letting everybody know the policy of the, the company, but a heartfelt culture going on. I've been wanting to do stories and talk to people as well with a HR, human resources, about how they handle these types of issues moving forward. Uh, I mean, it's yes is, is the short answer to it. G Grady, in South Carolina, you know, ethics have been an issue around the Richard Quinn and Associates, and I'm not gonna, I don't want to tie these two. However, um, guys at the top of organizations start looking over the shoulder to say, well, wait a minute, let me think about what has happened over the past few years and decades. I mean, do, are, 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 are men in positions of power that you know of in the state of South Carolina starting to be concerned that this also might start to rear its head? Not that I know of, Chris, but betcha. Uh, and, uh, you know, because this, this is such a pervasive thing in, in not just our society, but this, is, this has been going on for, you know, eons. And so uh, I, I'm certain this has is, this is got, got some folks who've, who've transgressed in the past. I've got, they've got to be looking over their shoulders. I, I do think the onus is going to go on employees as well because we keep hearing these stories, particularly at NBC, we hear about people knew about it and it was the best kept secret. And Wink so, and a nod type yeah, of Yeah, so I think things are going to be taken more seriously or they should be moving forward. Uh, and, and even human resources, people are going to have to go through new training probably. But I do think, again, it goes back to a culture uh, of leadership and I, I hope it leads to more diversity in leadership as well, which hopefully would change the cultures in, in some of these businesses. Well, certainly every day brings a new revelation and a new name to the fore. Uh, Grady, in South Carolina, it seems like this is a historic moment in the gubernatorial race. 
uh, Henry McMaster has chosen a running mate, which mm -hmm. is very odd that the governor never had a, a dual ticket between the governor and lieutenant governor. Why is that so critical? And, and is it more than just marquee? Is there something deeper to this? Well, it's, it's interesting times. The, the, the lieutenant governor you know, uh, typically was the president of the Senate. So, so you know, he, he or she had a, a, a small bit of power. Um, the part of that uh, legislative change or constitutional change is that that position was eliminated. Now the Senate will uh, elect a president pro temp. Um, so the, the interesting thing is that now the, the lieutenant governor will no longer be the governor's political opponent. And now there will be a line politically. The lieutenant governor doesn't really have a job description. And so that's what's so interesting is that this first lieutenant governor coming in likely will set the, the, the uh, precedent for what continuing uh, lieutenant governors do. And this now creates a line of succession to the governorship. Mm -hmm. Which so, uh, Henry McMaster seems to be have uh, seems to have very quickly embraced the idea of having a running mate here. Yeah, I think he, he chose well, Pam Evett, uh, you know, uh, woman-owned business, uh, you know, leader in the upstate of yeah. South Carolina, billion-dollar business, you know, it's Quality Business Solutions, I believe is the name of the company. Um, uh, you know, great credentials. Uh, certainly this is the other way of, of taking someone who possibly could have been a weaker candidate, shoring you know, shore him or herself, uh, mm -hmm. himself or herself up with a with a uh, a running mate that that fills in some gaps, and so somebody with that kind of business experience, the upstate connections, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I'm just speculating here, but you know, could be a could be another player out there on the economic development field, uh, you know, to to sort of help commerce go make some deals, you know, possibly, and, and right? Certainly a new name to politics in South Carolina, yeah. which will be fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, politics in North Carolina, ne <laughs> never a boring moment seems like in your life, Tim. Uh, redistricting. The f federal judges said you have to have a plan by December 1st. It's come and gone, and here it is now. Is there a plan in place? Is it a plan that can, can survive the General Assembly scrutiny? Uh, probably not likely because they don't like, you know, they're, they're not happy with the court system in general with how they've handled this. The special master has drawn up maps that the court ordered. Uh, the legislature very well could take that to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, because they were unhappy with the special master as well. Uh, I've heard this may not be resolved by January, and some people are speculating whether it could delay uh, primary elections in 2018 as well. So uh, that is far from over. You know, that's interesting. So the other thing that's related in North Carolina is this whole idea of judges being appointed mm -hmm. and not elected anymore. You know, a, a jurisprudence community wanted it to be appointed, but didn't want the General Assembly to have full control of it. Does this idea of reapportionment or redistricting, does it, it, does it help or hurt the issue of judges being appointed versus elected. Well, what's interesting is there's two issues here. There's the maps that were that are, that are like 60 years old, and then there's the issue of whether or not to elect judges. All parties, and including the judicial system and uh, political parties for the most part, agree that the, these maps need to be looked at. North Carolina looks much different than it did 60 years ago. And the idea that two pages were later on the ballot, people are voting for names they have no idea about is something worth considering. But the politics and where we are, the political climate, it's very difficult. Uh, Democrats have said that legislators want to put in a plan where they elect the judges, essentially. Republicans say, we're looking at all ideas that are on the table right now. We need to look at that. And I think we'll find out more in January when they come back for a special session. When does session start in North Carolina? Well, it should. It's a, it's a short session next right. year, so it should start in May, but they have a special session uh, slated for January where we could see constitutional amendments, uh, including things with the judicial system. And South Carolina General Assembly starts second week of January, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Grady, just a quick word. Uh, the SCANA saga continues to unfold. Uh, Shane mm -hmm. Massey, South Carolina Senate Majority Leader, was here. Uh, pretty hard on SCANA. Uh, saying, you know, you know, the, 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 of course, there was no excuse for what happened with Scanna going kind of over the tips of their skis. This is my, this is my term. But Shane Massey was very clear in denouncing how Scanna got to this place of fiscal insolvency, and and someone is going to pay for it, quote unquote. So, uh, in about 30 seconds, how is this? How is this story going to end? Boy, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it 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 is it is so complex, and and. 
you know, I, I guess I guess the way I think this, the story is going to end is there's going to be a ex very expensive hole in the ground uh, in South Carolina. And who Carolina. pays for it? I, I, rate payers? I, 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 shareholders? Right, right now it's, it's rate payers, but perhaps it'll get shifted over to shareholders. Yeah. But, but right now it looks like rate payers are on the hook. And that is not going to be tied up anytime soon, I'm assuming. No, this I think this thing, will, burn. this thing will be a long, slow burn. Thanks for staying with us, guys. Uh, we're going to bring our guest in a moment. Uh, next week on this program, he was at the point of the spear for economic development in North Carolina for a few years. Under Governor McCrory, he was the Secretary of Commerce. His name is John Scavarla. Uh, John is a lawyer, but at the moment brought to bear, uh, during his tenure, brought to bear not just his JD experience, but his economic development experience. He will be our guest on this program and then also in two weeks it is a two-part program maybe our most fun program and this is this is a crew member saying this most fun program part one a review of our regional uh, economy and part two is a look forward with four of our resident economists, Dr. John Connaughton from UNCC, Dr. John Sylvia, Chief Economist at Wells Fargo, Dr. Frank Hefner from the College of Charleston, Dr. Mike Walden from NC State. Uh, there's never a dearth of excitement with those four together. It's more like, a, it's more like the 4th of July, if, if, if you know what I mean. If I told you our guest leads an organization with almost 256 locations in almost 170 cities in North Carolina, thousands of employees, plus 2 million members, $37 billion in assets, around $200 million or so in income. Would you believe it's a nonprofit? Well, it is, and it's completely legit. Joining us now is the CEO of the North Carolina State Employee Credit Union, Mike Lord. Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Mike, you've been in the organization for decades. You are now the chief executive. Congratulations, by the way. Um, we're CFO prior to this, but you've got a lot of legacy in the organization. What are you going to do now as the leader of the organization versus what has been done, not just by your predecessor, Jim Blaine, but all the way up till now? Now, what does SCCU look like? Well, if you mean by that that I'm old, you're correct. <laughs> um, my job is to make sure that the culture of member service that we've built is continued and uh, that legacy of uh, member service is something that remains part of the fiber and being of our employees. So that's a job one for me. And we've got a lot of folks, uh, our board and staff that uh, believe it, our mission statement, vision statement, for example, and you've heard them before, are do the right thing and send us your mama. You've heard that. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to send your mama to some place that would mistreat her or not take care of her or look after her best interests. And that's what we try to do for our members, to make sure that they are taken care of, that uh, we're the trusted service provider to them. So my job is to make sure that we have the people, the systems, the hardware, software, the convenience and the accessibility available to provide mm -hmm. services to help our members improve their financial lives. Hi, so in, a, in an age of cryptocurrency and digital banking and innovation and all of those things that that lead us to believe that we are on the bleeding edge of, uh, of a progressive lifestyle, new lifestyle. I mean, how do, you, how do you position yourself in the financial services industry that is moving at, at light speed? That's a challenge for all financial institutions because everyone and their brother is in the financial services delivery business these mm -hmm. days. Insurance companies, retail outlets, uh, everywhere. Um, the challenge is to stay relevant. You mentioned cryptocurrency. No telling which, where that will go. Uh, I think right now, the idea that uh, the value can go from $1,000 to $10,000 almost overnight should be disheartening and scary to most folks. So there's going to a long road to go before they figure out how that's going to fit into the financial puzzle. But that will play a part. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a matter of being relevant, being trusted, and provide services that our members need. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, as we look to who's going to lead that, uh, uh, banks have not been big fans of it, obviously. What's your take, if there could be reform, that y you'd like to see? Well, as a credit union with assets greater than $10 billion, we are subject to the uh, regulation of the CFPB, and they've been in our shop. Um, the, my take is that they have done some great good work, and that's a little unusual to... to here out there in the world, and they've gotten some bad actors out of the business uh, of uh, predatory lending and other sorts of things that cause consumers harm. 
So I hope that when regulation and deregulation is put in place, that they don't cast the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, there is a place for consumer protection, and even if there may be some regulatory overreach, there's a lot of good that's been done. Uh, right now it appears that the orientation is more toward eviscerating and shutting down the CFPB than taking the good that has come out of it and make that uh, show up in a consumer. You think, is this a quick follow-up, you use the term uh, overreach. Do you think uh, that the, the industry, financial services industry, is willing to tolerate federal overreach if it means protecting the depositor and the client and the customer? I think the orientation right now is deregulation practically at, at any cost, and, I, and I'm concerned about what that might look like. So I think that financial institutions are fair, and uh, they do provide good services and businesses. Um, they run a business, and regulation and compliance has a huge cost, no question about that. Uh, the good intention of looking after folks is what needs to be brought to bear in, in taking a look at how regulation is, is um, enforced. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Grady, I cut in front no, of that's you. Fine. You know, I was intrigued to find that you guys had gotten into the property management business uh, back at sort of the tail end of the recession to try, try to help keep your members in ho homes that were foreclosed, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that? Are you guys out of that business now? Are you still, do are you still, still doing that? How, how's, no, how, we are very that? much in that business. Um, we formed a property management company called Secure, uh, principally because as a financial inst institution, a credit union, we could not hold property for longer periods of time. The idea for a financial institution is you make, take deposits, you make loans. If you must foreclose, you have to sell that property and move on. You're not in the property business. Uh, but as uh, using the secure property management company, we can rehabilitate properties and hopefully improve property values in communities rather than doing a quick sale on uh, a property that may decline in value and drag property values down in communities across North Carolina. And as we depreciate the properties over a period of time and generate some rental income off of them, we'd be in a position to later sell them, hopefully at a gain, and reduce the overall loss to the credit union for a, a loan that has uh, gone into foreclosure while we improve the property values in the communities of North Carolina um, and then perhaps be able to make a loan to an individual that we sell the property to. We have 1,400 properties in uh, the property management company uh, wow. as we speak, so we are very much in, in the middle of that. On a different note, the, uh, the security issues, uh, people worry about nuclear war and other things, but you know, you talk about the grid and financial services. How much of your time and resources uh, in your business are now put into protecting uh, financial assets? A huge amount of time and effort. Um, cybersecurity is a major issue for everyone, and we spend a lot of money and hire a lot of folks and bring in outside counsel to make sure that we're, trying, we're protecting members' uh, assets and their data. So we have multiple layers of security and hardware and software protections and antivirus and anti-malware, intrusion detections, uh, control uh, um, studies of internal controls and of controls over data processing, uh, patch management. Uh, there's a, it's a cottage industry and it's critically important to, uh, to the members that we protect their data and to the membership uh, and our, our reputation. Great. Well, talk, talk a little bit about the foundation that you guys have. You know, the thing that's intriguing about, about credit unions is you, you, you seem to do things that are, that are broader in scope than, than other financial institutions, and I was, I was also intrigued to find that you guys had a foundation. Talk a little bit about how that, how that works and how that's going. The SECU Foundation is one of the best things, I think, that uh, we have done. We've got our board and management that put that in place. We're far-seeing. It's funded by our members. There's a dollar a month service charge that our members are charged for the checking account. By the way, we have one checking account, so we keep our product simple. It has a dollar a month service charge, and the members can elect to have that go to the foundation. We have 1.1 million checking accounts, so it's a million dollars a month that goes in there. So there's about, seven, there's about 14 million dollars or so a year that goes into the foundation. And our board uh, manages to responsibly give that money away or invest it in wonderful projects 
across uh, North Carolina, including a cancer center in Newburn and a cancer center in Asheville, 13 hospice houses which we've helped construct teacher housing in four or five communities where they're having trouble attracting and retaining teachers uh, in the area because of unaffordable housing. Um, there's an investment made to make loans to uh, uh, finance and build affordable housing. The SCCU family houses that uh, are in uh, three or four, three different locations that provide short-term staying at, uh, at an affordable rate for families who have a member that are, that's being treated for a major medical malady, uh, wonderful things like that, and a scholarship program that reaches out into all 100 counties of North Carolina providing a $10,000 scholarship to high school uh, student and two $5,000 scholarships to attend the community college system in North Carolina, all 58 campuses. It's wonderful. It's a great investment in our communities. It's all funded by our members and it's uh, strongly supported. It does a lot of great good. Well, Mike, there's a, uh, there seems to be an orderly transition of power and the most powerful job monetarily on this globe and that is the transition of the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm. And it seems like the Trump administration's candidate for that job is probably gonna get it, Jerome Powell. Mm -hmm. um, when you, I don't know that you did watch his testimony, but when you either watched it or read about it or have a sense and you talk offline with your colleagues about it, what, what's your sense about the new Fed chair? Or the new possible Fed chair? <laughs> He seems to be uh, a highly regarded good fit for the position. That uh, that is a critical uh, position. It's important to the financial industry or the, the world at large, and uh, it's not a wild card pick, right. if you will. So I think that's given the markets and uh, individuals in finance and business some comfort that uh, this is an individual that will not upset the apple cart and go off in a wild new direction, that there's some consistency and, and the stability in that pick. Mm -hmm. Your, uh, obviously, state employees are greatly impacted by what happens on Jones Street in downtown Raleigh at the Capitol and beyond. Uh, how much do you pay attention or perhaps advocate uh, for state employees when it comes to the government and politics? It's a great question. We pay very close attention to whatever may affect our members. And of course, we serve teachers and state employees of North Carolina and retirees uh, uh, from those areas. We're not a political organization and we don't advocate. Um, we've got two and a quarter million members. Half are in one camp, half are in the other. If we start out to get out there and politically advocate in some fashion or form, we're gonna alienate a million people. Our focus is on member service, and we, have, we are a proponent and an advocate for a higher pay for teachers, but we're not uh, legislating, and we're not lobbying the legislature to get that done. Uh, it's a matter of um, common sense practicality that we'd like to see teachers get paid more and state employees get paid more for the, uh, for the jobs that they do in educating our kids and and providing services to the citizens of the state. Great. So, so what's next for the credit union? You know, uh, you know you, you've done all these, these things. That I've, you've, I've seen the, the expansion of the business into all these other areas to serve members. What, kind of what's, what's, the next, what's the next frontier for a credit union? Well, we've got a lot on our plate right now um, with the um, credit union and the subsidiaries that we have. So what's next is to remain relevant, to find out what our members want and how they want the services delivered and to make those uh, services available to them. We've got 200,000 members who are, we call fat cats or zards. A fat cat is a six and a half foot tall orange and white striped cat as the mascot. <laughs> and we put a lot of uh, time in educating uh, youngsters on thrift and how to save and what uh, money is all about to try and provide a basic financial education for them. We do the same for Zard, which is lizard. Uh, don't ask me why. <laughs> um, and it provides the same financial education for uh, the teens and into the twenties in hopes that they will start off with a good uh, foundation and make use of debt responsibly and not get caught up in, in uh, financial problems. Uh, so. We have other services that run the gamut from 
cradle to grave in uh, retirement planning, um, basic will services, low cost services, basic things that, that we all need. Well, Mike, thanks for being on the program. It's, it's kind of refreshing to hear a CEO actually admit that they don't have all the answers. And, and the question about Zard, I have no idea why, but thank you for bringing that up anyway. <laughs> uh, good to have you on the program. Congratulations going forward. We'll all be watching. I'm sure you'll do fine, but thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Tim, nice to see you. You as well, sir. Happy thank holidays. You. Merry Christmas. Can you I say well. that to you? Of course right? you can. Yeah. <laughs> Grady, good to see you. Thanks you for too. being here. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching our program. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Hope your weekend is good. See you. Bye. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.